happy with here today, so I'm going to stop them. So apologies in advance. Um, hi, kia ora. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming today, and thank you to the uh, amazing speakers um, who've already given the time to be here. Um, my name is Alex Port. I'm a postgraduate student here at the University of Auckland. I'm also a member of we Are, the We Are the University movement, which has been involved in recent and heartening uh, repoliticisations of the student body. Um, through this, I've become involved in Occupy Auckland. I would like to acknowledge from the very start my privilege as a middle class, cisgendered Pakeha woman and to take responsibility for recognising my fortuitous relationship to the social structure, which means that I am often afforded opportunities to deny those without my dem uh, demographic provenance. I have stayed a number of nights at Aotea Square in the first week of the occupation and have seen the group grow from 50 or so initial organisers a week before the action began to the hundreds who are now uh, occupied with the day-to-day -day running of the camp in Aotea Square. Over the last year or so, I've been very interested in the growing protest movements that have sprung up around the world, uh, starting with student protests against coalition governments or state or serious measures in the UK, to the Egyptian and other Arab uprisings earlier in the year, to, as um, we've just heard, the Chilean and South American uprisings, and the US Occupy movement more recently, starting with Occupy Wall Street, and which has seen thousands of similar occupations spring up around the globe. Today I'd like to speak about how the Occupy movement relates to issues of gender, inclusion and safety. Before returning to university, I worked for a time in a domestic violence organisation, which, combined with my study, has informed much of my analysis on feminist issues in society and how these risk being merely replicated within movements purporting goals of so social and economic justice. We live in a world currently where, and this is in no way an exhaustive list, women earn significantly less than men for the same work and own a witheringly insignificant amount of the world's property. Where gender wage segregation abounds, meaning that certain types of work coded feminine, for example, nursing, teaching, cleaning, etc., are coincidentally considered to be of less economic value and are paid less than jobs considered more masculine. Where women shoulder much of the unpaid labour of care in response to social guilt mechanisms which frame demands for financial recognition as unvirtuous. Where the supposed dregs of gender oppression and slavery are in fact still very much present in the form of pervasive, denigrating attitudes towards women and other marginalised gender identities. An ongoing objectification and non-consensual sexualisation of women in the world of image and idea epidemic levels of targeted violence and harassment on the street and at home. Where a horrifically violent and routinely obscured rape culture is alive and well, meaning that within their lifetimes it is estimated, conservatively, that at least one in four women will be subject to sexual assault in their lifetimes. Despite the representations of these hate crimes that depict drunk women in dark areas, the majority of these assaults occur within the home or perpetrated by someone the woman knows. Often allegations of sexual abuse are minimised or disbelieved, meaning that statistics can be misleading. This is a global problem. We see it in the workplace, on TV, at home, in school and in the university. So what does Occupy have to do with this ongoing oppressive structure? Isn't it all about economic injustice and the failings of capitalism? Isn't this about the widening gap between rich and poor? Well, yes, clearly. But I would argue that there are other and related structural problems in society for which Occupy creates space for discourse and ideological reconstruction. Surely, if we want to tackle root causes of inequity, we should be considering from the very start the intersecting bedfellows of oppression. In my view, these are capitalism, colonialism and patriarchy. One of the most, host, excuse me, one of the most hopeful aspects of a movement like Occupy is the opportunity it presents to work from the ground up on these cooperative aspects of structural oppression. Within the social movements of the past, we see time and again the trope that certain groups' concerns can wait until after the revolution, or whatever you want to call the potentially transformative event. I think that this mode of thought carries a number of underlying assumptions around whose responsibility it is to improve conditions of life for people affected by gender oppression. The idea that the revolution will inexorably and organically result in ex uh, equity across the board is a dangerous one. I think this risks minimising the depth and the cause of the problems that intersect with capitalist oppression, meaning that true transformation may become impossible as we risk continuing in our language and attitudes 
practices that further modes of thought that value competition over cooperation and cynicism over generosity of spirit. It is not unexpected that these sorts of mechanisms recur within revolutionary movements. Those within these movements, though unhappy with their own situations, are, after all, products themselves of the very system of inequity which brings them to take action. Our language and culture is pervaded by internal logics which take for granted many attitudes and behaviours which perpetuate structural violence. Unfortunately, the very intersectional nature of social, social privilege inherently obscures the banal ways that we all contribute to their continuation. These systems continue because they are often invisible to those not affected by particular oppressions, meaning that we can inadvertently continue injustices which are naturalised through symbolic and ideological means. People genuinely interested in transformative movements must employ a good deal of difficult and complex self-analysis and a willingness to actively listen to those who have access to experiences which by virtue of their social privilege, they will never know. It is difficult in these times not to fall into the trap of playing the Prussian Olympics with regard to intersections of issues of class, gender and ethnicity. But a genuine change can only take place when we recognise that we must consider these issues together. At Occupy Auckland, we are currently working through many of these issues, and while there is reason to be unsure as to the outcome of these processes, I also prefer to err on the side of optimism. For example, we have set up a safer space, bleh, safer spaces policy designed to protect members of the camp from threats, intimidation, violence and abuse on site. This policy has a comprehensive anti-oppression analysis and stresses the importance of a survivor-centric attitude to occupiers' claims of feeling unsafe. Rather than buying into ideas that minimise, deny and blame victims or survivors for their feelings of danger. What we are seeing emerge in response to this policy is a divide between the idea of policy and the enactment of enforcement, uh, bred by the very embedded attitudes that I've outlined here. The policy at present is to exclude those who breach the policy for at least two days and then embark upon a process of restorative justice in collaboration with the conflict resolution, resolution group, whereby the victim or survivor makes the final decision as to whether to accept the offender back into the, camp, into the camp. This is a positive policy whose internal logic has the possibility of making potential victims feel safer and potential <coughs> offenders feel the threat of consensual censure for their actions. Unfortunately, we are also seeing the old ways re-emerge in these processes. In the last week, we have had a number of debates around occupiers who present a threat to certain groups on the camp, convicted sex offenders, violent ne'er-do-wells, and those who would rather cast blame on those doing the calling out of these people and actions than on the offenders themselves. This is an example of how if we are not very, very careful, if we don't acknowledge and think very carefully about the workings of systems of oppression and our own attitudes which support these systems, we risk merely constructing a sub-society which repeats these injustices on a microcosmic scale. This is why issues of gender inclusion must be actively and openly tackled as part of the central process of reinventing the social body. Why gender oppression must be taken on from the ground up. We must start as we mean to go on. Otherwise, we just replace a capitalist system which cooperates with gender oppression with a non-capitalist system which still cooperates with gender oppression. These problems will not fix themselves, and it is, be it is at best disingenuous and lazy, at worst irresponsible and cynical to assume that they will. My criticisms of potential ideological stumbling blocks of the Occupy movement in this regard, and my acknowledgement of the difficulty and complexity of, de of dealing with intersections of oppression, do not necessarily signal the complete uselessness of trying to attack social oppression on all sides from the get-go. Instead, I think that these are positive things that reveal the depth of these attitudes to us and provide a space for truly constructive action moving forward. For to effect genuine change, all of those attitudes that sit murkily in the shadows of our language and culture must be drawn out. To labour a bad metaphor, the plaster must be ripped off the wound, which hurts, but which affords the wound the best possible chance of drying out and healing in the sun. I choose to be optimistic about the potential of the Occupy movement in tackling issues of gender oppression. Because if there was ever soil fertile enough to plant seeds of hope for a better future for marginalised gender identities, 
this will be it. I could be proven wrong yet, but I choose to believe that we can collectively improve attitudes and behaviours around gender. If I was not able to believe this, I think I may as well stop. Which is a sort of nihilism to which I cannot subscribe, however remote the better future may seem to us from here.